Right, and hello, and welcome to this session uh, recapping and working on the, the narrative and characters um, in that form of An Inspector Calls. So the first of our lessons sort of drawing us together in this half term. Now on the screen, as you can see, you've got the challenge outcome, which is to recap the narrative and characters in Act 1. And of course you've got the Aspire as well, which is to explore his authorial choices, his previous authorial choices in Act 1 of Inspector Calls. So hopefully a lot of you will also feel you're able to push on to that Aspire outcome as well. Right, as a quick starter task, a chance to uh, reflect on how well you remember these key characters from the text. We have got Berlin, Mrs. Berlin, Eric and Sheila. So the idea is for these, you try and list as many adjectives as you possibly can to describe them. Give yourself, say, you know, three, four minutes, a uh, minute, couple, two, two minutes, count each character, and go for at least four, if not more, adjectives you use to describe that character. So, for example, in Mr. Burley, we may go for oblivious is quite a nice word. He's oblivious to the realities of the world around him, to the truth about his family, to uh, his own behaviour, all those sorts of things. If you want to push it a bit further, you want to go in for the green box, which is to pin down when the text of the adjective would be particularly applicable. So with Burley, for example, the word oblivious is particularly applicable um, in Act 1, where we get his big speech. And we hear about things like you know, the Titanic, uh, war in, you know, um, with, with the Germans, for example, or the Church in Russia, and so on. Um, he is completely oblivious to the world around him. Okay, so basic, just adjectives, and if you can push beyond that into making specific references to moments and that kind of thing. Right, with this being the first session where we're revising Inspector Calls, really, um, the task here is designed to get you thinking about what happens and when. Now we know there are three acts in the play, so your task is to try and list as many as possible things that happen in these uh, in, 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 in these three acts. Some examples you've given there in terms of Act 1, the Berlin's are at dinner, that's how the play begins, Gerald gives Sheila the engagement ring, and Berlin gives a big speech about the Titanic and so on. Now that is not a complete list, obviously, of things that happen in Act 1, but do aim for a minimum of five maybe per act, um, realistically 10-15 would be even better, but minimum of five. Try and organise your ideas on the page. Uh, as previously, if you have the text in front of you, you can write all over that. Exercise book is fine, notebook is fine, whatever works for you. But do try and list as many as you can. I would recommend doing it from memory to begin with, and then check what you've said against uh, you know, the uh, text, if at all possible. Right, next task then, a bit of extract dissection. So we have on the left a key part of uh, the text from Act 1, and it's Eric asking about war, uh, and attempting to discuss something with his father, and of course Mr. Berlin cutting him completely uh, down to size, and um, trying to put negatively and patronisingly in this big speech all about um, the Titanic and so on. Now on the right hand side in the yellow box you've got some prompts. Now as ever these are standard prompts that we're using in all these different um, extract based um, activities. So we've got narrative, character, vocabulary, imagery, linking, context, and themes. Now you will find that pretty much all of these are always relevant. There may be one or two where it's slightly more challenging to link them in, and that's absolutely fine. But do have a read through. Try and annotate uh, based on those things as much as you can. There's a green box exception as well, which is the overall effect of these authorial choices. That's what we're trying to do. Uh, we've had a chance to do that. Press play, and I'll run through a couple of ideas that might have been worth thinking about. Right, narrative. Uh, what's happening in the extract? Well, of course, this is Eric attempting to engage with his father on some of these bigger ideas about war, poverty, and so on. And Berlin essentially completely ignoring his son's perspective. Now, why is it significant? Well, for a few reasons. One is that we see actually from Eric and from Sheila as well a degree of um, moral awareness or even socio-political awareness that goes beyond Berlin. Berlin is Berlin is wrong about pretty much everything in the world. Eric, although he's shallow, and um, as we know uh, from later in the play, uh, a criminal uh, who's done some, some awful things, um, as a young person, he also has the capacity to change and to see things for kind of what they are. And that is important. You know, these contrasting perspectives, the younger generation with Eric and the older generation with Berlin. But also, of course, we have the, um, you know, the symbol of uh, Titanic in particular, um, you know, is that representing the overconfidence of Berlin in the middle class and capitalism and so forth? Character, the impression given the characters. Well, of course, you know, we have Eric, who is 
um, powerless, that you know, not as, 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 as oblivious to the world as he perhaps could appear. And Wellington is the exact opposite. I mean, he is uh, powerful, perhaps beyond uh, what is reasonable and rational, but also completely lacks self-awareness. Does the moment change how we view them? Well, it adds to it, it builds on it. It's the indication that Eric is perhaps not beyond hope entirely, whereas Burning, of course, um, is very much that. Vocabulary, words that help us to infer and choice of particularly as significant. Well, there's, there's, there's a number, really. We have a play here of um, Fiddlesticks, uh, which is quite a nice one, which shows Burning absolutely ridiculing um, this idea of, of, of there being any kind of war. Titanic as well. I mean, Titanic as a word is interesting. It conveys this idea of enormity and strength and dominance and power and stability. And these are all qualities, of course, that Burning himself seems to view that himself as being and his society as having. And that simply isn't true. So there's lots of vocabulary choices you could be picking up on. And imagery, of course, Titanic as the key symbol here, the key metaphor, that's important as well. Um, linking, it doesn't link back particularly neatly, um, although perhaps our first impression of the Burnings, that could work very well. Um, in terms of linking forwards, you could certainly uh, link forwards to um, you know, the inspector's big speech in Act 3, where he talks about um, you know, the fire and blood and anguish and that kind of moment, the reality of things, the potential cost of those things. Context, uh, vitally important here, of course. Uh, as we know, the play is is written right to, you know, at the end of the war, um, and performed you know, pretty much as the war ends and just after the war ends. Um, but it, it, it's set in 1912. And the context here is important because, you know, an audience at the time would have known the Titanic sank. They knew this happened. They know that the war happened as well. Um, that kind of sense of dramatic irony. Um, our priest is wanting us to see Burning as someone who's completely, he's, he's, he's completely fraught. The Burning does not know um, of what he speaks. Um, and, and, and we do. And that sense of obliviousness. Uh, but also the, the causal process that it is the arrogance and overconfidence of people like Burling society that lead to events such as you know, the two world wars. Um, themes, ideas, issues or concepts relevant here as well. Arrogance, overconfidence, class system, degeneration, uh, masculinity, you know, um, all those things can be said here. Um, and that's, that's that that is important. Well, I'm just going to draw on some of the things from today that we've talked about so far. The idea here is you try and put those into, um, you, you fill in the blank spaces here to create like a profile of the character of Burling. Now, as you can see from the boxes around the outside, they cover a wide range of topics. And these are standard boxes you're going to use with every single major character in the texts that you are doing. Hence these boxes. Um, key relationships, key actions, changes quotations, ambitions, concerns, motivations, possible causes, name causes, and link images, symbols, and themes. Now, there isn't necessarily the right answer to, uh, to some of these. So for that reason, I'm not going to give feedback on this. Um, now, how you lay it out in your book is entirely up to you. You could draw this grid if you wish to. If you have it printed up in front of you, you could just simply fill in the boxes. Um, or if you wish to, you could simply organise them on the page of your exercise book or your notebook and together. That's absolutely fine as well. Whatever you do, do please make sure that it is neatly labelled and clearly organised because that will make it far, far easier um, to revise from when you come to do that throughout your exams uh, next year. Right, and that brings us back to our overview. So hopefully everybody will feel that they've had a chance to, to recap the narrative and characters in Act 1 of the Inspector Calls, particularly, of course, Mr Burling. But hopefully also a lot of you will feel that you've managed to push on to that aspire objective, which is to explore priestly's authorial choices. Um, so particularly in that extract annotation task, I hope a lot of you will feel you've had a chance to do that as well. Thank you very much for your time today. Be safe, be well, and I will see you on the other side.